Hi, welcome to Fertility Talks. I'm Mary Wong, and I'm the founder of one of North America's leading wellness centers. I am the author of the best-selling book, Pathways to Pregnancy, and I am your acupuncturist and fertility strategist. Tonight, I am so super thrilled and honored to have with us a guest for the very first time that is a man talking about fertility. So hello, how exciting is this? And not just talking about fertility, but it's really your fertility journey with your partner. So Todd Miller, I really want to thank you and acknowledge you for being here because I know you had a struggle and that you want to share and talk about this. Like, really, thank you. You're welcome. I've, uh, I've found that I'm a bit of an outlier sometimes with, with being a guy and, and sharing a lot of information. Uh, typically, men tend to internalize a lot of things and, and maybe think about them too much and and not really, really share them. So my mission, since I've been involved in media, is to really just, you know, open the pages and just share with people authentically so that other guys can go, you know what, I'm feeling that too, or I've felt that and I've had this experience and um, my journey is similar. Well, and, and this is exactly why we're doing something like this, right? Because Gosh, I've had over 180 something, probably 185. I don't even know now um, episodes that I've created because just that, like we want to, the goal is to open up the conversation, dispel the shame, normalize fertility in a way that is more acceptable and just, you know, talked about, right? And to inspire and to create hope. And so, you know, as you say, more men or less men talk about it. I totally agree. And there's been this stigma that even I felt that when you reach out for help with this, when it's such a, a life altering decision, there, there's shame or or a feeling that you're not quite adequate or something's missing. And, you know, I've even heard people say, you know, if you can't get pregnant naturally, the old fashioned way, why bother? Like, why would you do this? Why would you spend money and, and involve other people to help you do that? And it's just mind boggling that that happens in this day and age. Well, yes. And, you know, how you are left feeling, at least for myself, I don't know about you. It's like, gosh, you feel like perhaps you're a lesser person or, you know, you're not worthy or there's so much judgment. It's right. Because the people that say these things don't really know. They are well-intentioned for sure, but they say all the wrong things. That was my point is if it was meant to happen, it would have happened naturally. So maybe it wasn't meant to happen. And I don't buy that at all. And I'm so grateful that even with all of the history of what we went through, I'm still happy that we came out the other side. With well, and, and so again, I really want to thank you for being authentic and open. And I just want to give a bit of a backstory. It's like, how the heck did you show up? And that, that I know that you have a history, right? So um, for those, those of you that do not know, um, Dr. Tanya and Wild and myself, the, the naturopathic doctor and myself as an acupuncturist, we have another YouTube um, channel and podcast called Embrace You First. And with that, we're like, okay, let's do it right. And we're going to get a sound person. We're going to like make them really stellar. And not to say that fertility talks is not stellar. It's just that they're like totally raw and uncut and they're on on the YouTube channel right now and in our Alive Holistic Health on the Facebook platform. And we wanted to do something a bit more polished. And we found you and our first conversation on the phone led to this, this conversation about fertility. And I'm so blown away. And that's probably what made you say, you know what, you're a guy. You know, everyone that's been entering my life since I've, I've been on this journey in the last maybe five or six years to sort of just figure out who I am and where I need to go. And, and these people have been attracted into my life and they bring good, good energy. And I felt the good energy in that call. And, you know, of course I went and <laughs> checked out your pages and saw who you were. And then I saw fertility and I thought, oh man, can I, can I feel that? Mm. So it was uh, meant to be, I guess. I, I think so. Right. And so anyway, without further ado, let's, let's dive deep into your conversation about your struggles. And I know, of course, I mean, the whole, the whole point is hope and inspiration. So thankfully you came out on the other side with two babies, not just one, but two, but it took a lot. So let's go through this because when people watch, they're typically in the midst of their struggle. Right. So 
I should start where the topic of children came up. I uh, was separated, working on a, a divorce at the time, and my partner and I went on a date. And first date was great. Second date, we're sitting there. I think our appetizers had showed up, and she said, "I just want to be honest with you. I don't think I'm done having children." So. <laughs> I think I put my fork down and went, oh, that's an interesting topic of conversation on the second date. Now, we were probably in our, I would say, um, late 30s, mid to late 30s. So I guess for a woman that is thinking about that, and that's still an option, I probably guess it would be a good idea to get that conversation out of the way early. So <laughs> <laughs> second date, why not? <laughs> well, you know, it could have been we were dating for six or eight months and then I want to have children. And I'm like, well, maybe I don't. And we're in the wrong spot. Right. So uh, we got that conversation out of the way early. And I believe my answer was, I don't think I'm going to say no. And I'm not entirely sure, but it's a possibility. Because then I'm assuming then in the first marriage, there was no children involved. There was, was one. There? one. Oh, there was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I have okay. a 22 year old daughter now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. She's doing great. So, and so, all, so in that marriage, there was no issues with fertility. No, no. And you no. were young, then yeah. too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So in the second, so did your partner or who your current partner? Did she yep. already have a child as well? She had two previously. Wow. Yep. Wow. And then she wanted to have more, and then you struggled. Right, and they were, you know, they, they're her children. My stepkids are, are, were of an advanced age. So I was a little surprised that she wanted to go back down that road again, but she had young nieces and I could see that she was really engaged with them and, and she could see that I was really engaged with them. I loved, I still, I mean, I, I swear I have ovaries because every time I see a newborn, I want to cuddle it. I want to pick it up and walk around and it's just incredible. Uh, so I joke around with my friend, Julie. I say, every time I see a, a newborn, my ovaries clench. I just go, oh, I want a baby. <laughs> So I love that. <laughs> so there were we, we dated for a few years and then uh, we decided to try and get pregnant. So uh, we actually got pregnant once on our own, which unfortunately involved in, in a loss. Yeah. So then we went to our GP and said, OK, you know, things are what's going on. Is it our age or what are the, what are the factors? So, you know, after ruling out a few things, we decided to go down the fertility clinic route and, and get some professional guidance and help. So we then tried IVF the first time. So you went straight into an IVF. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. IUI. Okay. IUI. Got it. Okay. We did IUI first. Right. So that's an and, insemination. Yeah. Right. And that uh, we got to six weeks and then we had a loss. So you got pregnant with that first IUI and Correct. then you had a loss. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's two losses. Yeah. Very, Very early. Very so we, we kind of had a feeling something was up. Um, so later on, we discovered a whole bunch of different things, but you know, we were still in the early stages of trying. So um, yeah, we, we went back and tried again um, and we got to 18 weeks. And we went in for a routine ultrasound. I mean, no warning, no, you know, and as tough as it was for us, I just, to this day, I feel for the ultrasound tech who expected wow. to be listening and seeing a heartbeat and movement and seeing nothing. I mean, young, young person, they must have been truly horrified. You know, maybe they'd been through that before. I don't know. Yeah. But uh you know, I wasn't in the room at first, and then they called me into the room, and then they said, there's no movement, there's no heartbeat, and sort of ushered us out. And I'm taking my partner, Carrie, out, and she's crying in front of all these other pregnant women. So it was just a horrific, horrific situation. Absolutely, it, because you're not even at the fertility clinic anymore. You're at the regular OBGY and and with a whole bunch of big bellies, right? So that's tough. Right. You're in second trimester. Right. And we were expecting, oh, yeah, baby's fine. It's this, it's that measurements. And, and uh, yeah, and then you walk out of there knowing that, that you've had a loss. 
And then comes the whole, you know, operation later. And which was, you know, we had a really nice doctor and he was very nice about it, but it was a very final, you know, it was just, that's it. Your pregnancy's officially done. So when you say operation, what do you mean? How, they didn't make her try to deliver? Um, no. What did they do? No, DNC. They did it. Okay. So they yeah. did it with DNC. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they were able to do that. It was small enough for you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so then we took a big break, um, you know, several years. We just, you know, reevaluated and decided, you know, maybe things are good the way they are. And then it's always in the back of your mind. And you're always thinking, oh, you know, you see people with strollers and you go to the park and just for a walk and you see lots of kids. And it's always like just nagging at you saying, you know, maybe we should try again. Maybe we should try again. So what kept you going? I think what kept us going, I should actually back up because what I should say is when everything was final, we both had a very different reaction to that more advanced loss. Sure. Tell us about that. Yeah. So Carrie was very angry and depressed and I was very numb. I was very numb and I wasn't really saying much. So we found a support group for people that had lost um, had lost pregnancies and we went to try and, and get some support. And you're feeling very much like you're alone in this. You know, it's just, you've had a loss. Oh, well, you know, and people are just continuing on with their lives and your world has really stopped for a period of time. So uh, we went to a support group and uh, we sat with other people and it was difficult because I, I sensed the women were feeling it more than the men that were in the room. And what we came to learn from that support group was women tend to be bonded with the child as soon as there's life. Mm -hmm. And the men don't actually bond and feel intense love until they see and hold the baby, until the birth. Right. So we had these incredibly different reactions. And, and part of the therapy was, you know, Carrie expressing anger that I wasn't responding the same way. So that, that took some time to work through, but I'm glad we got support to do that, to, to work our way through. So, so that is amazing that you say this, and I never quite thought of it this way, but you're wholeheartedly right. Because of course, how can you bond with life when the life is not coming through you and you don't, it's not tangible. It's not visible. It's, it's not palpable at this point. <laughs> You maybe you can see some movement or, you know, uh, maybe your partner says, oh, I feel a kick or something. But by and large, we are somewhat removed from that process. And the women every day, you know, they're, they're sleeping, they have to sleep on their sides or they have to do different things or they're not getting great sleep or they're moody or, you know, they're having all of these internal physical challenges. And, and by and large, the men are sort of yeah. How are you feeling? Can I cook you a meal? And they're trying to help out, but it's not tangible. Like you said, it's not real yet for us. So do you feel helpless or do you feel disconnected? I, you know, what's going on? It's during, hard to ask a man, a how do you feel? <laughs> during a pregnancy? Uh, well, even throughout, like, you know what, let's back it up a bit, right? Because a lot of people, so there may be people in this group that have had losses for sure. I mean, honestly, every menstrual cycle is a loss. Correct. Yeah. Right. And so let's be real for, with that. But then to have a late loss as well, that's a whole other story. But just the whole difficulty in having a baby when you wanted, right? It's, there's a semblance of lack of control or gosh, what's wrong with me? You know, the shame, the stigma. Yeah. And that was, you know, uh, we were starting to rack up the losses. And I don't mean that in a very cool and disconnected way, but it was, there were signs that again, maybe this isn't meant to be and you know, what's wrong with me or, you know, what's wrong with my partner? Why, why this should be just so natural and so easy and it isn't. So you're starting to feel angry because it's something you really want and something that you've been denied and you know, have been denied several times. So, yeah, you know, and again, you only share so much with friends and family because after a while, 
it's kind of like, you know, when you've decided uh, at, at a late age that you're going to be a champion skateboarder, your family just look at you like, it's not going to happen. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you going down this path continually? And unlike being a skateboarder, this is, this is real loss and this is real pain and real trauma. Yeah. And some people just couldn't understand it. Right. And I can see that because, of course, I'm even thinking of the people that could be watching that have never had a child and can still judge and say, well, be lucky and grateful that you have what you have. Right. Correct. Cause that because that is there. It's like, thank God you have one. I don't have any. Right. Mm. That is yeah. there. And I get it. Absolutely. But simultaneously, you know, we all have um, our own stories, our own paths that we're walking. And I can just see how I can, I cannot imagine a late loss actually like uh, how heartbreaking that would be. And I just wonder, you know, through this, how did you manage to stay afloat as a couple? Like were there challenging times beyond just uh, the actual loss itself, like through the journey itself and like what, how did you overcome you know, how did you guys keep together? Because that's there for people too. I think with any challenge in a, a couple's life as a couple, whether it's financial or, or death or, or pregnancy issues or trouble with children, you know, it, it impacts not just that part of your life. So it's not like you can compartmentalize your pregnancy loss and park it when you need to and go to work and, you know, have family gatherings and, and be strong as a couple because it's, it's part of you. It's, it's deep in you and you can't, it's not like a shirt you can just take off and put back in the closet. So it impacts all parts of your life. Mm -hmm. So while you're having this stress and, and anger and depression regarding the loss, you know, other factors come in where you're thinking about moving or you're thinking about, changing jobs and and it just completely permeates everything so there were many challenges many challenges um so were you depressed when you say you know you can get depressed so it, it was that you yourself as well or your wife or ma mainly your... my wife I, I was definitely feeling low I wasn't feeling great and again like you said with the shame and the what's wrong with me you're always asking yourself this question you know Am I not, is everything not right that I can't have a baby? Is it me? Is it her? Is it us? You know, is environmental factors. I mean, there's so many different things that, especially when you're dealing with, you know, a fertility clinic as well, they, they read you all of these things, you know, do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you do this? Do you do that? So that they can narrow down all of your challenges to help you get pregnant. So, so, so there was a lot of other therapy as well as a couple that we had separate and apart from, from that to work through other issues as we, as we healed. And did you do anything? So, and that's really great. I, I love it that you worked on it, you know, psychologically, emotionally, mentally. Did you also, um, both of you actually, did you also look towards how you're eating and, and like the environmental piece, all of that? Um, probably not as much as we could have. Um, you know, I know at one point in time, uh, Carrie went on some, um, some fertility pills, you know, to try and just boost everything. And, and we were, we were trying to eat better and sleep better and get more exercise to do, um, to be as healthy as we could, you know, considering our advanced years, <laughs> you know, we weren't 22 years old trying to get pregnant. We were 36 or whatever the year was, you know, so. Well, it's funny that comments. you say this. I mean, most people that come to us in fertility clinics are at least 35, 36 years old, right? And um, that's just like the norm. And in fact, um, I'm going to say there's more and more evidence to show that people are just waiting in general to, to get together as a couple. So even the first timers are not getting pregnant till they're, you know, late thirties, if not early forties trying to conceive. So everyone's going to the clinic at what we call advanced maternal age. I think right. society has changed so much where, you know, you got married at 21 and you had a baby by 22 and, you know, it's now everyone's working on their career or their passions first. 
or traveling or backpacking or whatever, getting all the fun stuff out of the way because they think once we have kids, we won't be able to do that. So let's go ahead and, and really enjoy life. And then before you know it, you're in your late 20s and maybe you've accepted a new job offer that requires longer hours. And I can see that now that, that people are, are putting it off later and later thinking potentially that things will just be okay and they'll just work out. Yeah. Did you get a diagnosis? Um, we got a couple of things. She was um, found to have a prothrombin mutation, which is a, a blood disorder, which, which I don't know if it directly impacted the pregnancies. So what we found possible. is that we possible. possible, we found we could get pregnant, but we just couldn't stay pregnant. Yeah. So as it turned out later, when we went and we finally, um, worked through the last IVF, we started working with Mount Sinai and the team there was incredible. And they actually diagnosed her with uh, with having a um, thin membrane. So when she was pregnant, the babies were working their way down. So we ended up having cerclages for the last two pregnancies. Okay. And bed rest for right. a long time. Which is tough. Yeah. But you did it. So, so you had the first pregnancy through IVF and then, and then the second baby. So the first baby we had IVF and what we did to just give ourselves ourselves peace of mind was we rented a little um, ultrasound unit so we could monitor the heartbeat as often as we wanted. And I got so good. I was thinking, maybe this is my career. Maybe I need to be a tech because I could zone in and there it was and I could find it. And it really just gave us a sense of peace and calm. At How often were time, you using it? Um, to be honest, there were days where it was probably maybe every couple of hours. Oh my gosh. And then once we realized things were progressing okay, and we were past like, you know, week 20, week 22 and 24, it became less and less, but then it became more of a bonding experience for me. I could hear that little heartbeat every day right. and I could, I could just hear that person. Right. So, and I did the typical singing, talking, so they could hear my voice and playing music and doing all that silly stuff. But it was a way for me to sort of shake off all that grief of feeling disconnected from the process and really aged with the pregnancy. Wow, that's amazing. So he came out and um, great team at Mount Sinai again. And uh, he's a great guy now who's 12. Wow. He's almost as tall as me. And so um, that was great. And, and we thought life was great. And, and, you know, through our course of discussions and follow up, they said, you know, you, you, it's okay to have regular intercourse. Now you're probably never going to get pregnant again. I mean, it's just not possible for you. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, sometimes when the pressure's off, things work in mysterious ways. So yeah. 18 months later, you know, we had another birth, all natural, no intervention, nothing. He, Aiden just showed up. He was just, don't know how it happened, but there he was. And I love that. And this happens. I, I, I this does happen. Obviously it happened to you. So for those people out there, it's like, you know, when you have that one, when it finally happens, sometimes it's like, it just is a gateway to have it happen again. You know. Well, because we didn't set out to have three more children or two or five. We just wanted one. Mm -hmm. And then once we had the one, all the pressure was off and everything, and you started to heal and, and you thought of the ones that you lost and, you know, in a, in a funny way, they sort of made life possible for, for this guy in a manner of speaking. So then, uh, yeah, we just got pregnant. And I it was a shock that. to everyone. And, but the same thing, we had the cerclage and we rented the Doppler monitor, the ultrasound, just to listen. And uh, because it was like, but we were pregnant by ourselves before and it didn't work out. So again, we went back into that, you know, kind of just hoping and wishing and praying and, and not fearing the worst, expecting the best, but just being hyper aware. And so for the first pregnancy, she was pregnancy she was on bed rest for four months um and the second it was probably three three and a half so i was caring for a one-year-old and taking care of carrie as well who was <laughs> bed rest so uh it yeah. was it wasn't fun 
Wasn't you did fun. it. Yeah, we did it. We wow. did it. That's amazing. That's we did it. Really... And now they're 12 and 11 and uh, being very quiet as, as we're chatting. Wow. That's, that's incredible. So thank you for sharing this. And I know that again, you know, for, for the men out there, I hope that they're watching this as well, just to know again, that they're not alone either. Like the, you go through your losses, your own way. And you go through the whole journey your own way. And, you know, sometimes women may feel like, but you, you're more articulate about it. I think some men are just very silent about it. I think that's part of it. Maybe about a lot of things. And I think that it's really important that men find their voice and that men feel part of a bigger community. So, you know, there are groups out there. So if they have experienced losses, there are groups that will counsel you as, as a couple and as separate entities, because you are right. You grieve, and you move through the process completely at your own speed and your own hiccups along the way. But when you have a group, um, it was for me a bit of a relief just to hear other people had the same issues and we weren't alone and we weren't there was nothing wrong with, with us we weren't bad people because this happened no no not at all right i mean it's but that's the whole point in all this is like when people go through it there's all these negative self-talk and self-doubt and fears and all these things that show up that normally wouldn't be there if you weren't in this predicament no, as in, you know, if you lost a job, you know, there was a better candidate or something else happened. It wasn't necessarily a reflection on you. But again, this is, is very, a very personal thing. So there is judgment and shame sometimes that's directed at you. So then, you know, let's, let's end off by, if you're to give three advice, maybe for the woman and then the man as separately and then together, like what would you tell them as they go through the difficulty? Because what we also know is that sometimes it makes them or breaks a relationship. Sometimes it allows people to lean in towards each other, but other times it's the complete opposite. Yeah. I, I don't know why I researched this at one time, but I was looking at the contributing factors to the end of a marriage and, and loss of a child was one of the, the top ones that, when you lose the child, the parent, sometimes if there's no other children, just lose the sense of couple that they, they, they grieve in their own way. And then they just find maybe that there's just not enough in common anymore. So, you know, as far as my advice would go for women, um, one of the things we learned, as I mentioned earlier, is that men don't grieve the same way necessarily about a loss. Because again, for many men, it's not real until it happens. Mm. So I would just say to women that just to be cognizant of that, if, if that in fact ever happens, or if they're in the middle of it right now, that, um, and I mean, just, just people, people have different strengths as well. So when there's a loss or a challenge in life, some people are able to bounce back quicker than others. For men, I would say, um, be honest, be vulnerable. Don't be afraid of showing how hurt you are. Um, if you're afraid that that's going to anger your partner or, or set them off or make them worse, make them feel worse. I think in fact, it actually makes them grow as a couple because then the woman hears from the man that there's, there's real loss there. There's real palpable feelings. So what do you mean exactly by that? I just want to get more into your brain as a guy, because I'm not a guy. Yep. So meaning um, you're, the loss is sensed in a different way. Correct. You may not talk about it so much, but so what does it, like for a guy, what does it mean to look vulnerable? Crying if you need to. Um, there were probably lots of times where I were just choked up and, and just held it in because as much as I'm in touch with my feminine side, I do occasionally go back to being this, I don't know if it's hardwired in my DNA, but being more reserved and keeping it in and, you know, being strong. And naturally that's who I am anyways. I'm trying to be strong for other people, but you really need to just let go and let it out and grieve and Love be that. emotional and show that, you right. know, don't be afraid because then it just, 
it's like it's festers inside of you and it never goes away. Because what would it mean? Like, what does it mean to, normally to a man if you cry? Okay, if I put my traditional guy hat on here, it means that you're weak. Uh, you know, you're you're more feminine than you should be. Um, you know, I've heard so many things throughout my life directed at me because I've always been more in touch with my feminine side and been completely okay with that, even in my own family. And had people look at me funny because, yeah, I have gone to a spa. I've had my nails done and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's no big, oh, it's out there now. It's on the internet. Yeah. Um, but I think there's that other whole equation that you just need to be authentic, be real, be vulnerable, share, share what you're feeling with your partner, with a therapist, with your friends. Because if it's a bunch of guys standing around, they're not really talking about their feelings. They're talking about whatever groups of guys tend to talk about sports scores or politics or, you know, and I don't know if they would share there necessarily and say, you know, this is really weighing on me. We had a loss and I'm heartbroken. Good time to bring that into the conversation and, and make those friendships deeper. Absolutely. And I can just see how, you know, when you share this, I can just see how moved I would be if I was your partner thinking, my God, you get it, right? I feel that much closer because you get it and uh, we can bond more versus feeling a separation, right? So for me, it's the difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is what people give you when they're sorry for you. Empathy is trying to understand how you feel and and. And that's really what the couple needs to do together is, is bond and, and feel empathy for each other for this tremendous loss. And, and my final piece of advice as a couple would be, you know, don't just leave this. If you've had this happen or it's happening now, get help, get therapy, um, join one of these groups. They're probably all virtual now, but just share, share your experiences, share your loss and you may find that you're there, as I found in my therapy session, I became more of a support than I thought I would for other people who were feeling the loss more um, it, greatly than I did. Right. And it opens up your eyes towards it, too, the different perspectives and different kinds of losses, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you just you just share and you become a tight knit group of people who are there to support each other on this shared journey. Wow. Thank you so much for this. And it's so insightful. And I love getting, as I say, the male perspective, right? And, but you're a highly evolved male. I mean, some men watching this might go, oh, I don't think I can do that. So I, for the men watching, I challenge you. And for the women watching, let your partners watch this and perhaps they'll be moved to a point where they can share more. Right. Absolutely. I, I think it's just, it's going to be beneficial for everyone if 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 you just learn how to communicate more effectively and share honestly share where you are in your life so that you can get to healing and and better place thank you oh my gosh okay guys it's been a pleasure as always to serve you and i hope that this served you in this conversation so go check out all my other previous posts as well you can also skip on over to uh, embrace you first where by the way, Todd Miller here is the one who actually, um, what do you call it? You're editing and you're, what do we call this? I produce the podcast. You produce it, yes. So. And I get an education every week. I learn <laughs> something every week. I really do. Well, and we love you for doing it. You do such a great job. So if you guys are Thank out you. there wanting to create podcasts, you need to call on Todd. And perhaps actually at the end of it, you can just put in your um email or uh, your contact information sure. for others okay that'd be I'll awesome put it as a comment. let's everybody share this because i think this needs to be talked about more so share this um youtube video and um for those for later on go to meet mary wong on youtube you'll find it there okay thanks guys yeah. love you and we'll talk soon take care thank you so much for being thank here with you. us again appreciate okay. it Sorry.